Hello, and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Laura. I'm Kate. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Today, we bring you Bookshelf, an episode dedicated to the books we're each reading outside of Book Club, the ones that we get to pick and choose for ourselves. We took a break from podcasting this summer, so have had plenty of time the past few months to dig into our personal TBR piles. What did that include? On my list, I have On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Vuong, A Deadly Education by fantasy author Naomi Novik, and Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead, recently shortlisted for this year's Booker Prize. Great Circle is on my list too, along with Booker International Prize winner At Night All Blood is Black by Davi Diop, Mud and Stars by travel writer Sarah Wheeler, and, as we're now fully in back-to-school mode, Re-Educated by Lucy Kellaway. How I Changed My Job, My Home, My Husband and My Hair. Keep listening to hear what we thought of them, and if we found any gems for book club, or simply great books you'll definitely need to slip to the top of your TBR pile. All that coming up, here on the Book Club Review. Unrelated to anything, but just because I haven't talked to you for a while, how crazy is it that they haven't filmed Earthsea? by Ursula Le Guin. It is crazy. Isn't that yeah. nuts? I was thinking about that in the car the other day. I was listening to another podcast and they were talking about there's going to be a new adaptation of Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Like a series or something. And you're which like, is, come on I guys, go, what well, about I'm Le Guin? Quite happy, you know, great. I'll happily watch another version of that. It's a good story. <laughs> and I was thinking, it's so crazy that no one's done Earthsea. Maybe it's too old school. It's a bit old school, and also it's quite... Um, Does it have any uh, strong female characters? No, it has incredibly it strong does. female characters. That's the thing, right? The first book is all about Ged, and that's the traditional coming-of-age wizard story. Yeah. And then the second book is actually about Atuan, and there's a female protagonist, and she's the high priestess, but she actually is young and has no agency, and she helps Ged. But I think the thing is, the quartet jumps forward by about 15, 20 years each book. Yeah. And often they're quite dark. By sheer coincidence, I'm reading Ursula Le Guin's YA fantasy series, The Western Shore, which mm. I only learned about two months ago. I discovered it. I was like, what? Because um, I didn't know she wrote any other fantasy beyond Ursie. And it's really dark. It really gets into, you know, inequalities and a young man's, in this book, it's a young male protagonist, as he comes to realize, you know, the violence that's being inflicted on the women around him. He would never get this in Tolkien. So, I mean, she's great. As an aside, I'm also reading that. It didn't make the list because I'm like, I talk about Le Guin a lot. I also have holiday film-related literary news. Well, it's not news at all, but when we were on holiday, we were on the Suffolk coast and we went to visit Sutton Hoo because we were very excited at having seen The Dig. I don't know if any of our listeners had seen that TV series, which explored the story of how they dug up all these artefacts from this woman's garden, effectively, and the local archaeologist, played by Ray Fiennes, who manages to uncover all this stuff. So we went to look at the mounds. And then, because we were in the area, I wanted to go to a place called Bordsey, which is on the coast. I had never been. It's a little bit of a, like, why would you ever go there? But I was just curious. It's where they developed the UK's first radar station. And there's still a museum there. And I was just intrigued. And it's that bit further on from Sutton Hoo. We drove out and we followed the sat-nav to take us to the shore, Bordsey shore. And when we got there, it was just hilarious how, I mean, Suffolk can be bleak. It's actually one of the things I really like about it. It's very much these sort of wide, empty spaces. Think W.G. Siebald. Think about melancholy, poetic <laughs> thoughts as you're lashed by the chill east wind. And so Bordsey, when we got out of the car, there are these Second World War fortifications, pillboxes and a Martello Tower a bit further down. And we climbed up this little bank. To see the beach, we thought, oh, see the beach. And actually, there is no beach. It's just these incredibly forbidding concrete blocks, I guess, anti-coastal erosion, or maybe they were a defensive measure. I don't know, but just <laughs> massive concrete blocks and this drop and then this sort of grey sea. And you look down the coast and there's not really anything to see that way. And then you look the other way, and there's nothing to see that way. It's the Orford Ness, which is this empty, quite eerie shingle spit in the distance. Anyway, there was this large white kind of modernist looking building looked like it might be a house but it was just really didn't quite fit it was kind of odd like why is that there and we could see the 
pink signs that showed that some filming was going on. There was like location things and we could see people standing around. And then as we left, because, you know, not much to do, just looked at the bleakness, took it all in and then got back in the car. (laughs) We were driving back and I had to pause while a couple of walkers came down the road with a dog and it was a bit narrow. So I waited for them to come. And as they approached, I idly wound down the window and just said, oh, that house over there, do you know anything about it? And they were like, oh, it's that filming. It's that film, The Power. Naomi Alderman's The Power. Oh. Yeah, which just made me laugh because I haven't read it. But that is, is it not, a kind of dystopian novel where women have the power to control men through electric shocks. And it just made me laugh, like, you know, the bleakest place. And oh, yeah, they're filming a a kind of bleak futuristic novel there. That's interesting. I've read that, but I don't remember why they would need that. Apparently it was a nunnery or some kind of... Oh, yes, that's right. There is some sort of like nunnery or girls school. Yeah. It's actually in the US, but you know, they'd film it in the UK. And they built the whole thing. It was huge. Huh. That's a terrible book, incidentally. Could be quite a good film, but like so simplistic and unnuanced compared to Ursula Le Guin's fantastical creations. Anyway, just haven't seen you for so long. These are the thoughts that I must share. So what shall we start with? Yeah, what shall we start with? Well, should we start with Great Circle? Because we have both read it. Oh my goodness. Okay. And actually, there's a nice little follow on because I think on our last pre-summer show, our summer reading, I had just started it and was saying about how much I was enjoying it. So it's now been shortlisted, somewhat to my surprise, because it is so enjoyable for the 2021 Booker Prize. It tells the story of Marion Graves and her twin brother, Jamie. They lose both their parents at quite an early age and they are raised by their uncle, who's an artist, quite eccentric, and he lives in a remote cabin in the wilderness of Montana. And so they're growing up this kind of quite wild childhood, not unhappy necessarily, but they're sad because they've lost their parents and their life isn't easy. And Marion dreams of flight. She dreams of escape. She dreams of flight. And she encounters a female stunt pilot. So this is back in the 1930s. It's the very early days of aviation. And she encounters this female pilot and that makes her realize that it's possible for women to fly. Women can be aviators. And this sets her off on this journey, you know, this great passion. She just has to learn to fly. She then manages to find a way to learn to fly. And then by whatever means she can, she contrives it so that she gets to fly. And there's a whole thing about bootlegging liquor, flying it over the border. She gets involved in that and that enables her to go on these journeys. It flips back and forth between this story in the past and then a contemporary story set in Hollywood where a young actress is interested in Marion Graves and her story. There's some parallels in their life stories and she ends up playing her in a film and this is going to be her redemption because she had a kind of Hollywood falling from grace and this film is going to be the thing that brings her back. So it flips between the two. It's quite long. It's about 600 pages, I believe. Mm -hmm. To me, I felt like I was uh, flying through it. But (laughs) (laughs) it was good long. It was enjoyable long. Yeah, it's immersive. You get really drawn in. The characters were really strong and beautifully drawn. Not only Marion Graves, but also her brother. I thought the male characters were as interesting as the female characters. And it's all woven together very nicely. I don't know. It just really captured my interest. I don't know about you. How did you feel? I thought this would be the perfect summer reading book. I love historical novels, so it felt right up my alley. And then I started it, and the first, oh, I don't know, 50 or so pages are actually the backstory of Marion and Jamie's parents and how they met. Mm. And it's quite dark. Mm. And I was like, oh, 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 wait a second. Is this what I wanted? I also have a natural aversion to stories that span someone's entire life, generally. And that is what you get in this book, not just the beginning of Marion's life, but even further with her parents. So I went from thinking, yes, this is the book for me to being like, oh, I don't know. Hmm, maybe I'm going to put it down and switch. And I think maybe I did. But then when I came back to it, once we were in Montana with their childhood, it really worked for me. The Hollywood actress thread that goes through it is so jarring in terms of narrative voice. Mm -hmm. And I am not convinced it works. But I also kind of loved it. I don't and I don't entirely know why. Yeah, that's really interesting. I found I resented the interruptions of the contemporary story because it just wasn't nearly as interesting. And I really wanted to get back to Marion. She was the one I wanted to read about. I just was always a bit frustrated when it got to those kind of Hollywood bits and slightly speed reading to get through them. But then at the end, when it all comes together, 
I really appreciated why that contemporary story was there and how it yeah. worked. And I thought, well, that's good. It worked for me. Yeah, I think it worked for me. I think she didn't quite pull it off, but this is bookshelf, so we don't want to get into it in too much detail. We should say that because it has been shortlisted for the Booker Prize, we will be discussing it again with friends of the pod, Sarah and Phil, on our Booker Prize show, which will be coming out, I guess, late October or so. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing what Sarah makes of it. And whether it holds up on yeah. that shortlist yeah. against the others. She likes outdoorsy books. And I think this is quite outdoorsy. <laughs> I mean, it goes from Montana to Alaska to Hawaii to wartime England. Yeah. I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think she might like this one. She has a kind of wild heart and I think this might appeal to her. I never know. That's what I love about Sarah. I never know what she's going to think. Even less than you, I, <laughs> can I predict what she's going to think. <laughs> Okay, so we started with a good one. I see you've read, and I'm still so embarrassed not to have read it, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Wong. Was that good? I have. Yeah, it was good. A listener even sent me a copy of this book. And I just, no. it's just, I swear, it's right by my bed. It is waiting, like winking at me every night, but I still haven't managed to pick it up. Well, speaking of Phil, Phil recommended this to me a while back and said it was one of the best books he had read, I think, in 2020. And I, on that basis, bought my mom a copy for her birthday. And I think she read like the first chapter or two. And she was like, it's about a terrible mother who hits her child. I can't read it. And I was like, OK. <laughs> anyway, I picked it off her shelf a few months later. And as I was thinking about what to read on my week off with my family and so my proper summer holiday, it caught my eye. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to take it. It's wonderful. It is very much a fictional memoir. So I was about halfway through before I kind of Googled this to refresh my memory and was like, oh, no, it isn't Ocean Vuong's memoir. It is a novel. And then I got slightly sidetracked by an interview with Ocean Vuong by a young woman who'd grown up in the same working class community in Hartford, Connecticut. And he spoke to the similarities between his own life, but also was like, no, it's very fictional. I just felt that's where I needed to go. He's a poet by training or you know, by, by choice initially. So this is his first novel. It is the story of Little Dog, who is a Vietnamese immigrant. And he lives with his mother and his grandmother. His grandmother actually suffers from schizophrenia, but in her own way, it's a very strong presence in his life. And his mother is traumatized herself. She's been the victim of domestic violence herself. She and her mother both lived through the Vietnamese War and saw people die around them. And it's a very complicated family history, too, about how she and her mother came to America 15, 20 years after the war with Little Dog at that point. His mother actually looks almost white. I think she has slightly red hair. And yet she is Vietnamese and she does not speak English. And he is her voice, as is the case with so many immigrant families. And she is abusive, but she's also very loving and she's very traumatized herself. So my mom was like, oh, yeah, no, I just don't think I can read it. It's too horrible. And I was like, but I have such empathy with the mother, despite what she's doing to her child. We don't stay with him in childhood. We move through his life into his early 20s and his quite loving relationship with another young man. And no one really knows they're gay. Everyone just thinks they're friends. But the secrecy isn't the heart of the story. The heart of the story is that relationship and that discovery together and then what it means to be working class in America and the opioid crisis and the lack of resources. It's great. It sounds bleak. I didn't find it bleak myself. I found it a really easy read. Hmm. And is it really beautifully written? Is the language? I should be clear. In no way easy in terms of language uh. because <laughs> he is a poet. And, you know, I read quite a lot and there are definitely sentences and paragraphs where I was like, what is he getting at? Oh, well, let's just keep going. So it's not easy in the sense of comprehension, but easy, I think, in terms of enjoyment and letting it sort of slide over you. And it's not long. You know, I think it's about 180, 200 pages. Well, that is making me think I must read it. Funnily enough, that feels like a slight correspondence with what I felt was a kind of worthy booker in translation winner. At Night All Blood is Black by David Diop. Have you heard of this one? I haven't at all, no. Last year's winner was The Discomfort of Evening by Marik Lucas Reinveld, I think pronounce her name, um, which <laughs> has this incredibly, you know, sort of cover that you really want to 
pick up and it's painting a girl and you'd see half of her face and there's something really magnetic about it. And in fact, there was something really magnetic about that book. There was something really, the writing, you couldn't tear your eyes away. But it was so unpleasant, skin crawlingly unpleasant to read. And it is rare. And I like dark, I like difficult books, but you know, it is really rare for me to just put a book down and say, do you know what? I'm not going to pick that up again. <laughs> and that is very much how I felt. So then my association with the International Booker winner is kind of like, oh, you know, they're quite difficult books and they're not necessarily going to be that pleasant to read. But, you know, you sort of feel like it's really important to read books in translation. There is such a world of fantastic writing out there and, and we get such a small amount of it because we can only read things that have been translated and it's not very economic for publishers to translate books. So I think it's getting better. But yeah, anyway, it is good to seek these things out. So it was with some trepidation that I picked up this one. It's called At Night All Blood is Black. It tells the story of two Senegalese soldiers who are fighting for France in World War II. The story is narrated by Alpha and he has a friend he calls his more than brother, Mademba. And at the beginning of the book, Mademba is horribly wounded on the battlefield and Alpha remains with him as he dies. And then he's traumatized by this event, by the loss of his friend. He's got death and destruction all around him. And he comes up with his own idea for a way of enacting his revenge on the Germans who took his friend's life. And in fact, his tactics are so successful that he ends up unnerving his fellow soldiers on the French side, on his side, and he's sent away to a hospital behind the lines, supposedly to convalesce. So it's told from his point of view, you're in his head, you see things through his eyes, and it's probably sounding not that fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 indeed. And it wasn't fun, but in a way it was because I found it such an exhilarating read because it is such a brilliant book. I absolutely loved it. I loved the writing. I thought the writing was beautiful. I loved the sense of the author's intelligence. You know, sometimes you read something and you just have such a sense of the mind of the person who wrote it. And it can be just a real pleasure to be in their company and to kind of experience something that they've made. You know, so you're reading the story, but you have a sense of the creator behind it. And I think this is one of those books. And the point of view is weirdly enjoyable. You know, he's kind of doing fairly terrible things, this main character, but you root for him, you care about him. There's a kind of innocence and a childlike quality to him that you respond to. And also you see the context of these soldiers and the way that they were used and the way that they were exploited by the French, the way that their race was used. So they used to send them over the trenches to attack the Germans in a kind of mad frenzy. They used to blow a whistle and they would rush out there. And the idea was that these black men racing towards them, doing a kind of war cry, would terrify the Germans and that they would then be less able to defend themselves. And as a tactic, it I couldn't quite work out from the story whether it was effective or not but what you get very clearly is that it was an absolutely awful way to treat these men who were basically being used as cannon fodder there's a really vivid scene where two of the soldiers refuse to go over the trench because the thing is the whistle warned the germans they would hear the whistle God. and they knew yeah. So then effectively, there was just this barrage of gunfire and they would be cut to pieces. And so two of these soldiers refuse. They say, no, you're warning them that we're coming. We're not going to go out of the trench when you blow this whistle. And then their punishment is something really terrible in turn. And so you're very firmly on his side. But then as the novel continues and it goes back to the hospital where he's convalescing, you start to question where your sympathies lie. And you start to be not actually sure whose perspective you're reading. And there's a really, really interesting shift that I loved. I thought was just so well done. The way this is structured, I thought was brilliant. And at the end, you close it, you think, what did I just read? And you want to talk about it. So what I really thought more than anything else I've read recently is this would be so good for book club because it's a brilliant read. The writing is dazzling. The translation, I must say, beautifully done as well. It's translated by Anna Moskovakis, who also is a poet, I think. And it's very much a joint prize when you win the Booker International. It's a £50,000 prize and half of it goes to the author and half of it goes to the translator. 
recognizing that the translator does so much in bringing the novel to English speaking readers. And I thought she did an incredible job with this. It just sings. It really does this book. So yeah, a slightly strange recommendation, but a wholehearted (laughs) one. I think everybody should read it. And I think people should talk about it. It was on Barack Obama's summer reading list. Interestingly, you know, he knows a good book. he does know a good book. And you're right. You are a more mature, adventurous, resilient reader than I am. I will shy away from difficult subject material sometimes. And yet I have read some more challenging books recently, like Indian Horse that we discussed on our last episode, mm. On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. And they're reminders to me that difficult subject matter doesn't necessarily mean difficult reading. Because if the writing and story and perspective are good enough, you're taken somewhere special. And I'm kind of girding myself for the Booker shortlist and our required reading there because it all looked quite bleak. But I just started The Promise, which is on that list. And I'm like, oh, no, this is going to be great. So, you know, difficult subject matter doesn't mean difficult reading. So I've already spoken to two of my books and teaser, the next one is Pure Indulgence, Easy Fluff Reading. So why don't you tell us another one first? Well, my next one was, you know, one of those serendipitous holiday finds. I was in a secondhand bookshop and I found a copy of a book called Mud and Stars by Sarah Wheeler. I love Sarah Wheeler. She's a travel writer who's written many books, all of them excellent. But my touchstone book, the first book I read by her that I love to this day, is Terra Incognita, which is about when she traveled to Antarctica back in the days before everyone did. And she stayed there and it's a travelogue about her experiences there. But she's such an interesting writer and she's so sharp and observant about people and sort of human foibles and interrelationships. And I love all that. I love the way she captures all that. I haven't read anything by her for a long time. And partly the cover of this book caught my eye. It's just got this really beautiful, I guess, almost like a Russian folk design on it. But it's very lovely. And it says, travels in Russia with Pushkin and other geniuses of the golden age. It's her story of traveling around Russia using the idea of visiting 19th century Russian writers' homes as her focal points. And so exploring the Russia of the Golden Age, which she defines as 1800s to 1910, I think, but also contemporary Russia. She's learning Russian at the same time. So you get insight into her language lessons and her struggles with the language when she's there and how difficult a language Russian is, but also how enjoyable and fascinating. And as she's traveling around, she's doing these kind of homestays where she's staying on people's couches and getting some sense of their lives. And you get a sense of the vastness of Russia. I actually wanted to read a little bit. She says, I traveled across eight time zones from Rince northwestern beetroot fields to far eastern Arctic tundra, where Chuchi still hunt walrus in a region the size of France that has no roads. I paddled through the cauldron of ethnic soup that is the Caucasus where flashing epauletted Lermontov died in the aromatic air, and where sheaves of corn still stand like soldiers on a blazing afternoon, just like they do in Gogol's stories. I sunbathed fully clothed, even wearing a woolly hat, on the shore of fabled Lake Baikal, eating caviar with my fingers from a tub purchased at the fish market for 300 roubles, about four pounds. I went to writers' homes, one of a few things Russia does well, preserving them, I mean, I was at Turgenev's forest-buried estate of Spaskoy Lutvinovo in spring, when the scent of dog rose hung on the breeze, Bougainvillea tubercula on the walls. Turgenev complained in a letter that spring in Europe lacked the explosiveness of that season in Russia. I took the Trans-Siberian Railway in winter, crunching across snowy platforms to buy table tennis bats of dried fish from Babushki, and sailed the Black Sea in summer, where dolphins leapt in front of violet Abkhazian peaks. I was searching for a Russia not in the news, a Russia of common humanity and daily struggles, and my guides were writers of the golden age. I sort of want to be Sarah Wheeler. She's so great. Do you know, one of, the, one of the great regrets of my life, and maybe I'm very fortunate to have a life where this is one of my you know, great, great regrets, but I once had a chance to go and hear Sarah Wheeler give a talk at the Penguin Enclosure in London Zoo. They got her in to do a writer's talk and, and this whole yeah. thing was going to take place in the penguin enclosure. Yeah. And I had a and ticket. 
And then <gasps> on the day, I wasn't feeling very well. And I remember thinking, shall I go or not? And I remember thinking like madly at the time, oh, you know, she'll probably do another one. I won't go. <laughs> She'll what be in the I penguin thinking? enclosure again. When is Sarah Wheeler ever going to do another talk in the penguin enclosure at London Zoo? I mean, that was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I, oh, these days, I'm like, what was wrong with you? You should have just crawled there. You were sick. Oh, <laughs> That's what was I wasn't, wrong with you. The wasn't brain that wasn't sick. computing. <laughs> A great opportunity missed. Anyway, luckily, I can still get to read her books and encounter her that way. I loved this. I felt cleverer as I was reading it. Although, you know, there's huge, huge, huge amount of research that has gone into this book. You can sense it, but she wears it very lightly. She doesn't beat you over the head with it at any point. It was beautifully written. I thought she achieved the perfect balance between looking at these writers, whose works we may be familiar with, and their lives, which are all quite interesting and eccentric, and bringing to life what living was like back in the Russia of the era of the Tsars, and then contemporary Russia, and what a kind of huge, not very homogenous country it is, and how hard it is to get a grip on what Russians are like when this country spans such a vast area. She's funny. I think that's the other thing I like about her. Not obviously so. You're never going to sort of laugh out loud, but she's just funny the way she puts things. She's a great one for seeing the humour in situations. And that makes her writing so enjoyable to read. Unless your book club's the sort of book club that likes long, immersive, slightly complicated books, this probably wouldn't be for you. But I mean, my mother-in-law's book club, that's exactly the kind of books they like. And this, I think, would be perfect for them. So mm-hmm. it just depends. But if you're, you know, it's just someone who wants that kind of book where it's just going to really take you on a journey and lift your thoughts as you travel along with someone who's very clever and insightful, then yeah, I can't recommend this highly enough. I loved it. I was lucky that I was in a situation where I really had a lot of time and was very happy to sink into this. It's that sort of book. Well, I'm a little bit sheepish about my next read. <laughs> After talking about serious subject matter, the seriously good writing, my next book, or my final book, is A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik. Have you ever read Naomi Novik? No. She is a fantasy author, primarily YA fantasy, or at least with a YA bent. And I think she became very successful with Temeraire, which was her fantastical reinvention of the Napoleonic Wars, but with dragons, of course. So what would it have meant for the English to fight in the Napoleonic Wars if they had dragons to fly over to the continent and so forth? I read a few of those and I enjoyed them, but I didn't think they were great. And so I've never been a huge fan of Novik. I'm not sure this book changes that, but my God, it was fun. Um, <laughs> a Deadly Education. Either Naomi Novik has a very good commercial bent or her editor does. But I feel like someone said to her, Naomi, can you write a YA novel that is a mashup of Harry Potter and The Hunger Games? And she was like, yes, I can. And here is a deadly education, which... <laughs> The premise is that old children who have magical talent, same as Harry Potter, there are wizards dotted throughout society as we know it. And let's say the muggles, that's not a term she uses, but the muggles don't know about the wizards. Well, these wizards, when they come to a certain age, just before they reach about 13, they are like uh, beacons for all the hostile magical forces in the world. And there are many. So these wizards aren't having a great time swanning around the world. They're actually quite hidden within these little enclaves. And there's some who live outside enclaves. But basically, there are some horrible magical creatures out there. They want to kill wizards generally, but they specifically want to kill teenage children because they're super yummy and they want their magic. So hundreds of years ago, the international wizarding community created this school underground, which is sort of magically mechanized, and all the children are pulled into it at the age of 13 or so, and they're put through a rigorous education to protect themselves from these magical creatures, which incidentally are still able to make it into the school and to try and kill them at every opportunity. And so most of the children are dying left, right, and center, or a good chunk of them are dying left, right. I know, right? So this is the thing. It sounds awful. And there is a part of me that's like, 
oh my god, I can't believe you just killed off that like 14 year old girl in one paragraph. But it's done in this kind of flippant, freewheeling way. And actually, they are going to come together and fight off these spirits. And maybe there's a tiny bit of romance. Happily, it's not Twilight style where the girl becomes pathetic. If anything, she's very much like, no, no, I don't have time for that romance. Or mm -hmm. if that's even what's on the cards. The sequel is out or about to come out. And I'm not going to lie. I'm going to read it right away. Um, maybe, <laughs> maybe this series is like my Sarah J. Mass, of whom you are such a reluctant devotee. Yeah. I got a cheap Kindle copy of one of those books, A Court of Thorns and Roses. And I read about a third of it. And I was just like, I don't have time for this. <laughs> there, at least like the thing about a four volumes or five volumes, or there's a lot of them, I think. A Deadly Education is probably only about 300 pages. So, you know, you can kind of read it on your Kindle. No one needs to know in about three days. That's my And kind of we fancy. need a break sometimes. We need a break sometimes from the good stuff. Oh, yeah. You can't read serious stuff all the time. I'm trying to think. I'm sure I read some trashy things while I was away. I can't think what they were. I'm pretty sure I definitely read a couple of Georgia Hayes. It wasn't all deep, meaningful literary tomes. I did read quite an interesting book that I absolutely flew through which is by FT journalist Lucy Kellaway. And I knew about her. In fact, probably a lot of people would be familiar with her. She decided to leave her job as a financial journalist and retrain to be a secondary school teacher. She just got very comfortable having had this long, successful career and was married and had a big, lovely, comfortable London house and three children. I think when she writes about it journalistically, she perhaps hasn't been so upfront about her personal story. She's been more an advocate for the charity that she also set up. So not only did she decide to make this big career change because there's a chronic shortage of secondary school teachers in subjects like maths and economics and science. So not only did she decide to make this career change for herself, she also set up a charity to enable other people who were in a similar position to do the same. Her idea is that people can have had long successful careers but maybe they've got to a point where they're just feeling a bit bored and a bit dissatisfied and that they have all these amazing life skills. You know, they've been captains of industry or they've broken new ground launching products or they've managed to persuade people to change restructured companies. And, you know, all of these kind of really important skills that people have learned, you can transfer and that would make them amazing teachers. But at the same time, they have to be willing to take this great leap of faith and very much out of the comfort zone and train to do this job and then be thrown in at the deep end in a secondary school with a class of 30 pupils and everyone watching your every word. So it's partly the story of the mechanics of all of that. And it's partly her own story of her motivations, what led her to want to make this change. And I was very drawn to the fact that she frames it around this house that she saw. So there's a website called The Modern House, which British people who love a bit of property porn will be mm -hmm. more than familiar with. Definitely. It's a very, uh, it's an estate agent, but their particular angle on it that they came up with is they would only market homes of architectural interest. So designed by architects with some interesting architectural or aspects conversions. to them. Exactly. Or conversions. And then more recently, as everything has become more and more and more oriented to the online world. What they've done quite cleverly is they've pivoted into a bit of a content hub. So now they're doing features about all these amazing properties and everything's beautifully photographed. It's all very immersive. You can basically now spend a lot of time drooling over houses <laughs> that you never You're in. You're making me want to go check out what's on there now. In, yeah, never in a million years will be able to afford, but it's so nice to look and dream. Anyway, Lucy Kellaway, it turned out, saw this house and thought, wow, I love that house. I went to see it in real life. And it had an orange countertop in the kitchen. It was designed a sort of open plan Japanese style dwelling in Hackney, designed and built by the architect who lived there and was selling it. And she fell in love with this bright orange kitchen countertop he'd put in. And I suppose the sort of way of living that the house invited, which was she could see going to be very, very different from her quite compartmentalized life that she had in her family home. So she fell in love with the house. She's like to the children, I can't buy this house. How would that work? And they were like, well, no, if you love it, we don't mind kind of thing. So they seemed to be reasonably encouraging. She had, her husband had already been living semi-separate lives within the same house. And she describes that without too much emotional trauma as just being a very gradual parting of the ways between them. He edits the Spectator magazine. 
It's quite funny the way she describes it. It's a bit like me, actually, because I just sit surrounded by toppling piles of books that I never really get around to putting away. And he was the same. He'd just come back with carrier bag after carrier bag full of books. And so what had gradually happened, it wasn't just the books, obviously, it must have been lots of other things as well, but that he'd ended up <laughs> living semi-separately in sort of basement flat of their house. They were all still there together. Anyway, so I just mentioned that because it also meant that I don't think it was too difficult for her to pitch it to him. I want to go off and live by myself in this house. The way we live now is not working anymore. And I want to do this massive career change. I just want to throw up everything in the air. And when it all falls down, I want to see where the pieces land. And amazingly, he seems to have gone along with this to the extent that they never did get divorced. They live really? separately now, but at the end of the book, certainly they were still married. And she said, you know, we wow. don't, I, neither of us really see a reason to get divorced. That's intriguing. What I loved about this is the way it's not written as a series of statements. It's more a series of open questions that she's exploring. Can a person do this? What are the elements that make it possible for a person with her very particular privilege to be able to do this? And she examines that quite carefully in a way that I thought was, it was appropriate. I thought it was good that she raised that question. You know, not everybody can just buy a Japanese house in Hackney and decide to retrain as a teacher. Not everyone has the financial cushion that enables them to do that. And she's very open about that and interesting, I think, in the way that she reflects on that. And then you get the classic in at the deep end, finding your feet, having to learn from the beginning again, story of her experience training and then teaching in these secondary schools, which was not easy and the things that she struggled with. And I thought she was really interesting in the way that she considered all the ideas that arise from that. I was just dipping into it earlier and reading a bit about the way she was remarking on the fact that in her career and in her life, there wasn't really much diversity in terms of the people that she was encountering and mixing with and that that had been true for most of her life. And that suddenly she was in an environment where she was absolutely in the minority in terms of ethnicity, in terms of age, in terms of experience. And she was no longer sure of herself in a way that she had been before and how she dealt with that and how she had to learn and how she had to grow and change. And I also love the thing that perhaps she can't say for herself, but you really see in the little anecdote she tells about the way that she teaches, that element of the idea that when you've got someone who's got that lifetime of experience behind them in a profession, what are they bringing? You know, what's Lucy Kellaway, financial journalist, bringing to the job of teaching a class of 14-year-olds economics? And there's a lovely bit where she talks about it as a moment of difficulty because she has to follow the curriculum and she has a bit of debate with herself about whether in this particular lesson she's right or wrong to do what she did. But what she decides to do is to put aside the curriculum and teach them how to negotiate for a better salary. And when she's questioned upon this afterwards, she just is like, this is so important for them to learn. I wish someone had told me when I was at secondary school how to negotiate a pay rise. That's yeah. really helpful. And Interest rates on credit cards, for example. Uh, like framing teach all people of that. that stuff. Exactly. So framing all of that financial knowledge that you need to have, being able to then seat that within the context of the curriculum and the things that they are, you know, it's mandated that they learn. I found really, really fascinating. And then finally, this story about the bigger picture, about founding the charity, getting other people to... One thing she seems to be an absolute genius at, and that's obviously just her journalistic background, is publicity and... She has Radio 4 interviews left, right and centre. And I think they did a TV documentary on her and she's writing about it in the paper. And she's got this unbelievable network of contacts and cronies and people that she knows so that, you know, when the charity is struggling at the beginning, she fairly effortlessly lines up a person who's used to managing charities who will be the guiding hand and then she lines up a couple of hedge fund managers who've got money that they're happy to invest to help them get started but again I like that she was very upfront and honest about that and not everybody could do this but she was able to do it and so she did. I just liked this book enormously and I loved the way that I felt it raised so many interesting questions. I thought it was truly inspirational. I loved the way it was written and I just hope lots of people read it, actually, and feel inspired by her, as I did. I think she's what she's trying to say is that you're not going to reinvent yourself, but that you can make a big change. And that, yeah, this idea of re-educating yourself, that actually you can really shift your ideas and, and you can do something different. And ultimately, that might make you happier. I've seen a fair few people messaging back and forth with you on Instagram about this book. 
So I get the feeling it struck a nerve more broadly. I had a funny chat with my mother-in-law. She's got a funny bit towards the end where she's discussing whether when you get to your sort of early 50s and maybe you're post-divorced or I think, you know, she's to all intents and purposes divorced, even though they never actually got divorced, but she's dating. She's looking for love. And she keeps going on these really dreadful sounding dates of people she meets on soulmates or wherever and and because it's like older people she goes for a walk on Hampstead Heath with a man who spends the entire time telling her about his prostate problems and you know she's kind of just wondering to herself at this stage do I really even need a man do you need a man like you know to an <laughs> independent... valuable contribution yeah to a woman of independent means does she actually need I don't know again I thought it was an interesting question well my mother-in-law who's obviously quite fond of my father-in-law and very happily married I think was slightly outraged at the idea that I could suggest that he was effectively dispensable <laughs> yeah especially because you are married to her son she's yeah, probably like exactly. Kate what are you getting at exactly. and you're like no no do no we no need Just... do we need these men <laughs> oh well I feel like we did quite well for ourselves over the summer I am quite excited to get back to required reading though I don't know I guess that's why we are in book clubs and have a book club podcast because we like that well, you know what? It's not the required reading. It's the shared reading. Mm, yeah, like I've missed digging into conversations. So coming yeah. up, we're going to talk about Rachel Cusk. Which I read while I was away. And so, yeah, I'm looking I. forward to talking about that. So that's Second Place by Rachel Cusk. That will be our next book club show. And then, yeah, the Booker Prize episode is in the works. Like you, actually, I thought I might read The Promise next. Is that by Damien Galgut, is it? Yes. And I think I might have a copy waiting for me downstairs. A nice yeah. note to end on. I'm going to dive into that too. That's nearly it for this episode. Books mentioned were Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Vuong, At Night All Blood Is Black by David Diop, Mud and Stars by Sarah Wheeler, A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik, and Re-Educated by Lucy Kellaway. On our next book club show... We'll be discussing Second Place by Rachel Cusk. It's an atmospheric novel that tells of a woman who invites an artist to come and stay in a studio on the property she shares with her partner. But how will she be affected when this new, strong personality breaks into her careful routines? The book was long listed for the 2021 Booker Prize, but what did my book club make of it? And should you read it with yours? Listen in to find out. If you enjoyed this show, check out our website, where you can find our archive of over 100 shows to browse through. Everything from book club discussions to interviews with bookish folk. And we always make sure to weave in some book recommendations into every show. You can also explore our library of book reviews and articles. Don't miss our latest on the best personal development books to read for book club. And find out how you can have a great book discussion while also potentially changing your life. In the meantime, if you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes... Follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or you can email us at thebookclubreview at gmail.com. Drop us a line and tell us what you've been reading. We'd always love to hear from you. And if you're not already, why not subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts? If you like what we do, please do take a moment to rate and review the show, which helps other listeners find us. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>